During the three years which I spent at Cambridge, my time was wasted as far as the academical studies were concerned. I attempted mathematics, but I got on very slowly. The work was repugnant to me, chiefly from my not being able to see any meaning in the early steps in algebra. This impatience was very foolish, and in after years, I have deeply regretted that I did not proceed far enough at least to understand something of the great leading principles of mathematics. For men thus endowed seem to have an extra sense. Charles Darwin spent five years in the South Seas on the HMS Beagle before he published On the Origin of Species. It took some time for the significance of Darwin's theory to be realized. It was Gregor Mendel, an obscure Moravian monk, who saved Darwin's theory from the dust heap of intellectual history. Gregor Mendel was a student of mathematics at my alma mater at the University of Vienna. Note he was a student of mathematics, he was a brilliant a mathematician as a student, um, but he couldn't become a scientist because he failed botany. He failed botany twice and then sort of he had to look for other ideas and he became a monk. And as a monk he had the possibility of continuing scientific research. He worked in the monastery garden and he did various experiments with crossing peas. He would take uh, two different types, for example yellow and green, and he would mate them, he would cross them, and he would, observe, he would observe the ratios of yellow and green in the offspring. And those ratios turned out to have very, very interesting mathematical properties. Often you got three to one ratios in the offspring, for example, three yellow to one green. Now that's a mathematical observation, and since he was trained as a mathematician, he thought this is interesting. Mendel deduced from his ratios what he termed factors of inheritance. Either dominant or recessive, these factors could pair up in a variety of ways to control the appearance of the peas. Understanding the numbers and inferring the machinery that produced them demonstrated Mendel's facility in combinatorics. It has been noted the author of the 1826 textbook, Combinatorial Analysis, was director of the institute where Mendel was a student. What Mendel's important discovery was is that Heredity is based on particles rather than on continuously mixing substances, that it's particular. Darwin never knew about Mendel, but then when people put the two approaches together, Darwinian evolution and Mendelian genetics, it was again a mathematical effort, and this was the birth of mathematical biology. Today's biologists recognize the power of mathematics as an extra sense that can reveal the contours of invisible biological worlds. Mathematics can predict the future and reveal the past. Phenomena beyond human observation or the scope of research tools, phenomena either too small or operating on time scales too fast or embedded in structures too complex, show themselves through the lens of mathematics. Ever since the structure of DNA was obtained, we, we understood that DNA is really important for defining who we are. Um, it defines the proteins that eventually become us. At the present time, we don't know very accurately, sometimes not at all, how to predict what the folded shape of a protein is if I just know the, all the amino acids that make it up. People have been working on the so-called folding problem for a very long time, but so far they haven't cracked it. Now, perhaps some mathematicians will help them do that. There are some major challenges just because proteins are so small and because the timescales for folding are relatively fast on a human timescale. Uh, some proteins fold in a millionth of a second or in a thousandth of a second. So here we have our, our protein being manufactured by the ribosome, which here is my hand. So it comes out of a tunnel, and as it comes out, it starts folding. And we don't really know how exactly it's folding, but it's, it starts folding and it's produced 
one amino acid at a time. I want to, uh, to take this point of view that at a certain level of detail, proteins are made up of um, units that behave uh, as a good approximation as rigid units and that are connected with each other the way mechanical joints are. Uh, so these balls are representing amino acids, these edges are representing bonds along the uh, backbone of the protein, and they stay pretty much fixed distance apart. Some of the most frightening diseases of nowadays may come from protein folding gone wrong. Alzheimer, Medcow disease. Now, geometry isn't the whole story of how proteins fold, but the hope is that if you understand what you might do geometrically, then you could come up with models of what nature might be trying to do, and then either prove or disprove those models. I always tell my students when, when I teach them the beginner's modeling course, I, I remind them of Picasso's famous quote that art is the lie that helps you tell the truth. A model is always wrong. Um, I mean, it's always deficient and, and you constantly try and improve it or you understand its limitations. Um, but you never say a model is right. It's, it's always an imperfect representation of reality. If I show the results of my heart model on a computer screen, what you see is a simulation. And the whole reason for doing the simulation is that in, in most cases, it's impossible to tell just knowing the laws what the consequences will be. And so you need to write down equations, and then you need to use computers to solve those equations. The whole point of, of doing the mathematical model is so that you can then go and say, well, what if we did this, then I reckon this is what is going to happen. You have to make predictions, and then you have to go and test those predictions in the laboratory. And until you do that step of making a prediction, checking the prediction, and doing further experimental work, which was motivated by your model, then your model hasn't been, been any help at all. The organ systems that have been done so far are the, the heart and circulation, the lungs, um, and the lungs have been done to almost the same level as the heart now. Um, the digestive system and the musculoskeletal system. That's four out of 12 organ systems. I think we're going through a phase at the moment of using these models for diagnostics. But the long-term goal, it's not the only goal, but one of the, the, um, the really important outcomes is going to be drug discovery. If you accept the idea that in the end we're governed by the laws of physics, then there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be able to develop mathematical tools that allow you to express that physics in a way that allows you to do a predictive analysis of how a drug would affect a particular genome. Classical population genetics is prospective. Namely, what you're doing is you're trying to understand how a population changes over time, normally going from a present state to a future state. Right, so we're going with the direction of time. You make all these assumptions about the nature of the biological system. And those assumptions allow you to build a fairly simple mathematical structure to predict how many copies of a particular kind of gene in this generation will turn into how many copies of that gene in the next generation. So that's both a statistical and a mathematical process. With molecular data in the 1980s, new techniques were invented that were called retrospective. If you have a theory uh, of evolution going forwards in time, in a sense you just look at the mirror image of that theory going backwards in time. And that theory tells you that after a certain time and with a certain probability, you can expect uh, the genes which you carry and the genes which I carry to coalesce, that's to say to be descended from some common ancestor. If you continue this process for everybody in the population, in the human population, or perhaps a sample of the human population, you will get coalescences taking place at various times backwards in the past, and eventually you'll have coalescence at what is called the most recent common ancestor. That technique, the technique of coalescence, is what allowed them to, for instance, postulate uh, mitochondrial Eve, right? the most recent common ancestor from which all our mitochondria derived. To my mind, in terms of population genetics, that is probably one of the biggest innovations you're ever going to get. I mean, that changing the direction of time. If you want to know 
how the brain computes, how it does what it does, how it can learn, how it can store information, you need a way to observe it, some way that you can, you can measure the activity, right, and um, do that over time. 100,000 cells linked together is about one square millimeter of your cortex. So it's a little tiny patch, you know, smaller than your fingernail. And that's 100,000 cells. So you can see that there's a big problem. This idea of the brain tissue is, is kind of a computational substrate, is, is something that I would like to understand. What are the, the, the principles of this substrate? It's simply impossible to understand how thousands or hundreds of thousands of neurons are interacting to produce a memory or process information. Um, without adequate mathematical models of those neurons. I think it's very important to find out what is the simplest system that we can study where some of these properties still uh, can be quantified. What we're doing is we're taking cortex from an uh, embryonic rat, okay? and deconnecting it, right? So it's coming from an intact cortex and deconnecting it, putting it into a dish. It's reconnecting, it's forming its, its network again. And so essentially you set it back developmentally a few weeks and it's gonna redevelop into that network and all of this happens um, spontaneously. They connect in ways that are very different from the ways that they would connect in the brain, but I believe that they are networks of processing elements. So we wanted a system where we could take one of these neural networks, interface it to a flight simulator, taking information about the position of the aircraft, whether the nose is pointed up or down, or whether the aircraft is banked to the left or to the right, and we translate that information into a series of pulses. The network is adapting to the stimulation pulses that you're sending in, and because of that adaptation, it's able to learn to fly the aircraft, in other words, to be an autopilot and fly the aircraft straight and level. If you look now at biology, you see that biological systems, they interact with the world in a self-organizing way. They find through evolution the principles of the optimal operating points. And it would be fantastic if we could, as engineers, be able to come up with those optimal operating points also in the systems that we are building. And we don't know how to do that. And so I, I really believe that it's, 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 it's a fundamental step if we want to really understand complex systems. Ecosystems are a paradigmatic complex system. There's lots of species, there's lots of individuals, there's many different kinds of interactions between those species and individuals and populations. If you have many species, you're gonna have this big network, this big web, and math is a wonderful way of describing those networks. We can construct a web by drawing, as it were, lines in a diagram from the various species that eat the plants to the plants they eat. Some will eat only one plant, some will eat lots of plants. And then we can draw lines from the predators that eat the herbivores and some of the omnivores like us that eat the plants and the animals. And you get a web of interconnections. And now you can ask questions about the dynamics of that topological web structure. When you take a network perspective, it enables you to really see when you pull one species out of a network of species and there's all kinds of interactions leading to the other species, you're going to disturb all those other species in some way. We find specific species, people have called them keystones in nature, keystone species in nature, that if you take those things out, you lose lots of other species. It upsets the balance of nature and uh, many species go extinct because a particular species has been taken out of it. People are skeptical of equations. They're skeptical of computer models. They're not sure it represents what's going on in nature. When you've seen examples where you can really get things right by writing down the equations, 
you do look at the world differently. You, you perhaps get edge toward this belief that the world really is understandable. We see now a whole generation of young life science students growing up who are bilingual. They speak biology and they speak math. It's so much more powerful than we had ever hoped or ever realized. Uh, it's, it's a whole new biology.